Hello everyone, I'm The Enforcer, and welcome to the breaking news. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and support us on Patreon, link in the description below. We are getting breaking news out of every single corner of the world today, as in the Middle East we are beginning to hear that the Israeli strike has been finalized, and the strike is going to happen imminently within the next few days, according to Israeli officials, which will then kick off a war that will last months with the Islamic Republic of Iran, according to information from Israeli sources on the ground, and also statements from the Israeli government as well. Well, once again showing that war is here inside the Middle East and at this moment we are only counting down the hours to the beginning of the actual full-scale war that will be occurring instead of the low intensity war that we've been seeing for several months at this point. Meanwhile inside the Republic of Turkey we've also been able to hear incredibly interesting information out of this area as well as the Turkish aerospace industries building in Ankara has been attacked by an unknown explosive and hostages have been taken by an unknown group of armed gunmen. At the moment we have absolutely no information about the gunmen's intentions or the reason why they've attacked the Turkish Aerospace Industries building, but nevertheless, the situation is incredibly interesting. At the exact same time, the United States government and NATO's pressure as a whole have finally brought down the Turkish government to heel as they've begun to put an embargo or largely a sanction on all Turkish arms exports into the Russian Federation. A very interesting move, possibly showing that the Turks are finally having to bend the knee to larger Western pressures that have been made over the past few months months considering Turkey's largely anti-Western and anti-NATO actions that have been made not only in the Middle East, but also sometimes in pertainment to Russia as well. At the exact same time, we've also been able to hear of a major cooperation agreement made by the Baikar company and between the Turkish government and Ukraine, which will be hel greatly helping out the Ukrainians in their larger drone warfare abilities. Meanwhile, all the way across the sea inside of East Asia and the Korean Peninsula, we have been able to see that North Korea is once again along the footing of a war warpath with Kim Jong-un now today visiting strategic missile sites and uh, inspecting them, making sure that they're ready for whatever may be coming here in the future at a moment's notice. Once again, following along with the mobilizations that we already saw beginning yesterday, according to a statement by the North Korean government. At the exact same time, all the way over in Ukraine, we've also been able to hear some incredibly inf interesting information as well. North Korean military officers have been spotted inside of Red Square in the city of Moscow, and we have been seeing them taking pictures with the locals around the area, clearly showing that our assumption, or at least analysis that we made several days ago, that a Russian IL-76, or an IL-62 specifically, was flying back to Moscow, most likely with... North Korean officers on board was in fact correct as these North Korean officers have been spotted inside of Moscow and it does appear that they were being debriefed on the situation that they will be putting their own expeditionary forces into here within the next 24 hours. At the exact same time inside of Ukraine we've also been able to see that the Ukrainian government has been making some incredibly interesting steps already making a propaganda video directed at the North Koreans telling them that it would be best if they were to surrender to the Ukrainian armed forces instead of trying to conduct any kind of fighting against the Ukrainian state. The United States government has already made a, uh, made a statement today making it incredibly clear that the United States believes that the North Koreans are fair game inside of Ukraine, meaning that Ukrainian armed forces will have absolutely no reservations from foreign countries on striking and wiping out any North Korean forces that engage them in combat along any point of contact. Meanwhile, inside of Kyiv, we have also been able to hear that President Zelensky has brought forward a, a mutual hold, interestingly enough, on striking striking energy infrastructure in between the Russian Federation and Ukraine. If this was brought forward, this means that neither side will be striking each other's critical ener energy infrastructure over the course of this winter and would then resume the strikes during the spring, summer, and fall of the next year in 2025. But nevertheless, we do have a lot of interesting news to get into. And moving on down into the Middle East, War is here. I want to make sure that we say that without a doubt, at this point, from all the information that we're getting and all of the signals that we're getting, a Israeli armed action against Iran is coming around the corner, most likely within just the next few days. We are hearing that from uh, the Israelis themselves, as we are starting to hear from Channel 11, that Israel is about to attack Iran. The Israeli army has completed its preparations, and that is according to the Israeli Broadcasting Corporation as well. Both are largely government news sources of Israeli news inside of the country, and from what we can understand, conflict is going to be brewing up and coming around the corner here inside of uh, Iran and Israel here very soon. We have been waiting for the Israeli response for quite some time against the Islamic Republic of Iran, ever since the last major missile attack where nearly 300 to 500 ballistic missiles were fired from Iran, and we actually saw that a decent amount of them 
crazily made it through Israeli airspace and ended up striking some targets like the Negev Air Base. This appears to have been seriously uh, provocative uh, to Israel, quite obviously, and the Israelis have been looking to strike back at the Islamic Republic, but it does seem as though there has been some pushback to that from Western nations, including the United States of America, as well as France. Both countries have been putting a decent amount of diplomatic pressure onto the state of Israel to try and heavily limit their attack from their original ultimatum, in which uh, Israel said that if Iran responded to the killing of Nasrallah, they were going to start striking Iranian nuclear and oil facilities throughout the entirety of the country we most likely will be seeing that the israelis will probably not strike these nuclear or oil facilities anywhere inside the islamic republic and they may actually relegate their strikes to either trying to decapitate the iranian military's command structures or maybe destroy iranian key military abilities such as air power projection or maybe even destroying their ability to project at sea with the small iranian navy Either one of those is a bit of a likely option, and there's also a fairly unlikely option that the Israelis will conduct a decapitation attack against the Islamic Republic of Iran's government. We are highly doubting that that would be the case. It's not completely out of the picture, but we are most likely suspecting that they will be conducting attacks instead against the Iranian military in some sort of a form, either destroying their command structures, critical military infrastructure, or trying to just wipe out a large amount of assets in the, in the Iranian Navy or the Iranian Air Force, considering it would be the easiest easiest to cause irreparable damage to either of those branches. At the exact same time, we have also heard from another retired Israeli official that they believe this is going to be kicking off a war that will last for months, according to the retired Israeli Brigadier General Amir Avivi, who stated that Israel's counterstrike to Iran's ballistic missile attack against Israel will mark the beginning of a war that's expected to last many months. Not an incredibly short amount of time, but quite a lengthy bit of time. We are understanding that once again, because of the geographical restrictions of this war, most of it will be fought over the skies of the northern Arabian Peninsula, somewhere around Iraq and Syria, by the Israelis and the Iranians uh, all together. And we'll also see that the Israelis and the Iranians will continuously lob missiles and other kinds of uh, aerial bombs for the large part at each other through the area of the northern Arabian Peninsula. There really is no way for either side at the moment to engage each other in actual ground fighting so we do believe that this war while lasting months will largely be a war that's fought in the skies over the arabian peninsula and not on the actual ground itself we may see somehow that we're wrong but that would be highly unlikely as the iranians and the israelis have really no way to project an expeditionary force onto the other side's land or territory because either both sides simply just lack the ability to do so and also lack the diplomatic uh friendship of iraq and syria to be Able to transit their forces in between the two and on towards Iran or into Israel either way. Moving on out of that, however, and just a little bit north into the area of Asia Minor, we have been able to hear a very interesting piece of news that has come out today from the city of Ankara. According to information that we have at the moment, a major uh, Turkish aerospace industry, which is literally called Turkish Aerospace Industries, has been attacked by some sort of armed gunmen. We were able to see that a large explosion rung out of the facility in the early part of the morning, which we can see right here. And we can also hear sporadic gun firing in the distance near to the facility. The exact details about this attack are largely unknown. We really do not know a lot about what's happening at the Turkish Aerospace Industries headquarters at the moment or what these people really are. One thing that we do know, however, is that internal security footage from inside the building has come out, and it does appear that whoever these armed gunmen are, they have taken hostages from inside the factory and are currently holding them at the moment. We don't really know exactly what the intentions of these gunmen are, who they are affiliated with, or what their demands are at this exact moment. We haven't gotten a lot of information from Turkish authorities about this, but nevertheless, it is a very interesting situation as it's one of the few times that we've seen the Turks come under a direct insurgent attack like the one we're seeing right now. The United States and the rest of NATO have already given um, words of condolences to the Turks and have openly stated that they would support them in their further endeavors. This is a little bit different 
than what's been going on behind the scenes, however, with Turkish-NATO relations, as we have seen that a lot of diplomatic pressure has been put onto the Turks for them to relent on their Turkey-first position, or largely the Turks do what the Turks do kind of a position, or Turkey does Turkey things, as we call it here on this channel. We have seen that that has finally brought the Turks to heel, and we are seeing that Turkey is now imposing uh, sanctions on Turkish weapon exports being sent to Russia. According to information that we have gotten today from Visegrad 24, Turkey has imposed restrictions on exporting critical military goods to Russia, responding to U.S. pressure to prevent the supply of Western-made components used in Russian weapons production. The restricted items include advanced electronics, processors, memory cards, control systems, and other vital uh, equipment uh, vital to the manufacturing of military hardware. This will probably be a massive blow to the Russian Federation as, as the Turks were one of the third party countries that they've been largely setting up shell companies in and then trying to import Western weapon tech into Russia to continue some sort of weapons manufacturing abilities. But with Turkey now shutting them off, the Russian abilities to do so are going to be start, uh, will be greatly weakened over time. And we most likely will see that the Russians will be using far less advanced weaponry as the war goes on, as it will become a lot more difficult and a lot more expensive inside of Russia to be able to manufacture these weapon systems, considering the absolute lack of components that they'll be facing at that point. Meanwhile, we also got to hear some really good news from another major Turkish aerospace industry, Baikar. Baikar is the one that famously produced the Bayraktar drone. And we can actually see here that today, the Turkish company Baikar and Ukraine have signed a cooperation agreement. We don't know the exact details yet, but usually cooperation agreements like these usually fall along the lines that the Ukrainian state and the company Baikar inside of the Republic of Turkey will work together to streamline the production of drones for Ukraine and to help them out with their war effort against the Russian Federation. This is a very good money-making venture for the company Baikar, as well as the Turkish government as well, and it also will be helping out Ukraine to strengthen their drone abilities, which have become crucial to their defense at this point, and help them to continue to fight the Russians on a much more effective level, mitigating Ukrainian casualties while at the same time increasing Russian casualties, which is really what the Ukrainian command is going for at this point in terms of the casualty disparity in this stage of the war. However, moving on all the way over into the Korean Peninsula and carrying on with the large news that we've been hearing here recently, we are seeing that the North Koreans are continuing to conduct very hostile posturing towards South Korea to put larger amounts of pressure onto the South Koreans and also, once again, ramp up towards the steps to war. We have seen that as of yesterday, the North Koreans have begun to mobilize a large amount of North Korean citizens into the Korean People's Army, the armed wing of the North Korean government, or largely the North Korean Army armed forces. We are now seeing today that Kim Jong-un is following through on that by going and inspecting missile bases throughout the country. We actually got these pictures specifically today of Kim Jong-un visiting these missile sites and launch facilities and apparently inspecting them for their combat readiness. We can see, interestingly enough, a decent amount of North Korean officers with notepads out, because apparently Kim Jong-un has to come by and tell everyone how to do their job. Uh, apparently this would be very bad for management reasons, but nevertheless, this is how North Korea does things. We can see here they are showing off the missiles that they have currently inside of storage. We can also see Kim Jong-un asking if he can eat this. Unfortunately, it's not made of anything edible, so he cannot. Uh, this will greatly displease the leader, and he will most likely have this guy in the picture executed. We were also able to see that he was wandering through the woods, possibly looking for some wild animals to eat as well. Uh, we have been told that apparently all of the birds in North Korea have been eaten, except for these, and these will be eaten on Tuesday. But moving on from the jokes about Kim Jong-un being an absolute blubbernaut, um, we are seeing that ne uh, the North Koreans are continuing their dangerous posturing, and we can also see here something that is incredibly interesting as well. Pictures like these are very deliberate in the kind of message that they're supposed to send, and these North Korean trucks that you're seeing in the background behind Kim Jong-un are the exact equivalent of the North Korean Tapol M. Now, the Tapol M is a Soviet made nuclear missile carrier. It carries an intercontinental ballistic missile. You can actually see it right here. What you're seeing in the background behind Kim Jong un is the direct North Korean license build variant of this, and they also carry around nuclear ICBMs throughout the entirety of North Korea, constantly moving all day, every day. And when given the order to fire, they set up immediately and fire the ICBM towards whatever target has been selected. These kinds of pictures are supposed to be sending a message not only to South Korea, but to the rest of the world, including the United States, that North Korea will do whatever it needs to to be able to ensure that it is able to continue its reign of terror against the entirety of the Western world. This is why, for this reason, 
there is a very considerable emphasis on what's going on in the Korean Peninsula on this channel. It is not necessarily a regional conflict like any other. We are dealing with a highly destabilized and dangerous regime inside of North Korea that is nuclear armed and unstable enough that in a rash decision making process, if the survival of the, of the state is at risk, which could happen quite easily, they could begin to start lobbing nuclear weapons at a whole myriad of countries, including the United States of America, as well as the state of Japan. For this reason, that is why the Korean situation is a lot more concerning and serious and getting a lot more coverage on this channel than most people are giving it at this point. This is a very dangerous situation. And just looking at pictures like these, it's quite obvious at this point that the North Koreans are trying to, of course, give out that subliminal threat that nuclear weapons could be used at any given moment. And we were also able to hear that he said that the United States directly is threatening North Korea's security and it is necessary for the quote-unquote nuclear armed forces to be on standby for countermeasures. That largely means a preemptive nuclear attack according to North Korean doctrine and that is why the situation is becoming quite serious and not only that once again diplomatically this is falling off the rails. Unless if diplomatic talks begin or is there some sort of a lessening of tensions we will see that this continues to rise in tensions until a border skirmish or a full out regional war begins on the Korean Peninsula and then we do not know what will be happening beyond that point. A nuclear exchange at that point would probably be pretty possible un, uh, compared to other areas in the world because the North Korean government is so close to collapse most of the time that it wouldn't take that much to push them over the edge to where they pretty much are ceasing to exist so they'd like to take everyone down with a ship in a, in a sense of the word. But moving on out of that and out of North Korea, we've also been able to see that inside of Moscow something very interesting has happened today. We are seeing that North Korean officers were visibly seen. Everyone wearing these coats, by the way, these uh, like leather coats, they are the North Korean officers. And we see them taking pictures with the locals. And we can also see them walking around Red Square as well. Now, North Korean officers are a fairly interesting thing to see in Moscow because a lot of people have been wondering what was going on a little while ago. And a lot of people will remember, and I believe at the beginning of the video I said it was an IL-62. It was actually another version of a Russian government jet. Uh, it was, I believe it was actually a Tupolev, uh, and I believe it was a Tupolev uh, TU-207, uh, uh, if I'm correct. And let me see if I can find uh, Russian uh, government uh, aircraft. Let me go see if I can find this really quickly and show this to y'all. It was actually an Aleutian 96. That was the aircraft. And so let me go show y'all a Aleutian 96 from the Russian government. It's this aircraft right here. And we had actually seen one of these flying on flight radar from Pyongyang back to Moscow. And a lot of people were asking the question, what was this aircraft doing inside of Pyongyang? And why was it flying directly back to Moscow? And we put out the hypothesis on this channel many days ago, which appears to have been absolutely dead on the nail, that this aircraft had been sent to Pyongyang Yang to pick up Korean general staff and then fly them to the Russian Federation into Moscow so that way they could then meet with the Russian Ministry of Defense, be briefed on the situation, what will be expected of their armed forces, where their armed forces will be moving, so that way they can operate much easily in conjunction with the Russian armed forces. That was a dead on the nail assessment on this channel and not to, you know, toot our own whistle, but we can put that down as another thing that the Enforcer channel got dead on the nail, is that this was the general staff of North Korea being moved in advance of the Expeditionary Force itself because while the north korean commanders have been landing in moscow days ago and we're now seeing clear proof that they're there the actual north korean enlisted forces or really the actual fighting force of the North Korean expeditionary units was still at Karol, just south of Lake Konka, receiving some kind of training or field equipment being issued by the Russian Federation themselves. From what we understand, they are currently in transit on the Trans-Siberian Railway throughout the southern area of the Russian Federation and are now making their way towards the area of the Kursk Oblast, where they will then meet up once again or their senior officers, which we're seeing right now in Moscow, and then they will be deployed into the Kursk Oblast, according to Ukrainian intelligence that has been received at the the moment uh, this is something that the north greens are starting to get really close to finally bringing for, to fruition it's the first time that a major scale expeditionary force will ever be seen outside of north korea in its history we have never seen 
a North Korean expeditionary force that has been larger than a couple of hundred soldiers. This one, according to the information that we have, is about 10,000 strong. So this is the largest expeditionary force ever seen in North Korea's history. The Ukrainians are already beginning to realize that the North Koreans are going to be here soon and have already cooked up a propaganda video to attempt to appeal to the North Koreans so that they'll okay. surrender instead of fight. And just to show you all, here is a clip from that showing what the Ukrainians are trying to sell to the North Koreans to try and make them surrender. ...에서 새로 도착한 전쟁 포로를 수용하기 위해 가까운 장래에 전선의 여러 부문에서 포로가 된 최초의 북한 점령군이 이곳에 도착할 것입니다. 수용소의 전쟁 포로들은 별도의 수면 공간을 갖춘 크고 따뜻하고 밝은 방에 수용됩니다. 수용소의 전쟁 포로들은 하루 세 끼의 식사를 받으며 식단에는 고기, 신선한 야채, 빵이 포함됩니다. that the Ukrainians are trying to calm down the war a little bit. Not so that way, you know, and a lot of people, a lot of Russian propagandists will take this and say, oh, the Ukrainians aren't wanting to get steamrolled. But the reality is, is that strikes on credible inf energy infrastructure in winter causes a, a large amount of undue suffering on the civilian populations on both sides, as people can end up freezing to death in the kind of frigid conditions that are seen in this area of Europe during the time of winter, which is really starting to begin right about now. Um, it seems as though the Ukrainians are wanting both sides to hold off on this, so that way there is an undue suffering on the civilian population's end in either country, and we will have to see whether that's actually followed through or not by the Russians, or whether they would ever agree to something like that. We have a feeling that they probably will not agree. The Russians never seem to agree to anything along these lines, and they will most likely carry on their strikes on energy infrastructure over the course of the winter, and the Ukrainians will as well. We will only be able to see how that goes as time passes, but nevertheless, that is all of the breaking news that we have today. I've got to thank every single one of y'all so much once again for watching, and if y'all have enjoyed, please make sure to subscribe. It doesn't mean anything, and I mean, it means literally nothing in YouTube's algorithms. The YouTube algorithm doesn't really care how many subscribers a channel has anymore, they just care if the videos are good. So, if the video's good, it does what it does. But subscribing to the channel really makes us happy on our end, because while YouTube doesn't care, we care a lot if people are enjoying our content enough to be able to hit the subscribe button. It means a lot to us, it always brings a smile to our face when we see loads of people joining the channel every single day and so if you'd like to subscribe eh, you know you can if not it's no big deal you'll literally see the video tomorrow probably that will come out anyways uh also if you'd like please hit the like button please make sure to comment in the comment section down below and if you are going to put a comment down there put grunk in the comment section that is spelled g-r-u-n-k grunk Put that down in the comment section so that way I know you made it to the end of the video because it would be funny as hell to just see a, a million people down there putting grunk. And I will be going through and harding every single grunk that is put into the comment section. 
Also, one last thing, if you did enjoy it a great deal, no one has to do this, but if you did really enjoy it a lot and you would like to support this channel and help us to make this thing possible, you can click on the link in the description below and support the channel on Patreon. No one has to support the channel a single cent. The only reason you would, you have to is if you enjoy it and you want to see us to keep this thing running and help us to do this as a full-time job, but beyond that, you do not have to support it. That's just kind of a thing that folks can do if they really, really like it uh, to an insanely high degree. But nevertheless, I thank you all so much once again for watching and i will see you all in the next one take care and long live the least spring army